Cribiform is a type of Gleason 4 prostate cancer. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the details of what is Cribiform. Does it change the way you need to be treated? What are the side effects and the different things that it can do? And what are your options? So today we're gonna to talk to Dr. Mark Scholes, and he's a 30-year medical oncologist. He's focused solely in prostate cancer across his entire career, and he's treated a lot of Cribiform patients. And he's gonna talk about the details of what you need to know. So today we're talking about cribiform and you know when patients go and get a biopsy they get a pathology report and then they have a pathologist look at tissue samples and really what they're doing is they're grading you know what type of tissue they're seeing and they do it on a Gleason scale and then they're given a Gleason number and so sometimes on these reports you see a word like cribiform come up and I think a lot of patients you know they don't know what it is they don't know how to interpret it and do really do you have to change your treatments? What does it change and what can it cause? So what is cribiform? Think of cribiform as a refinement of the Gleason system. There's a lot of talk about genetic tests for prostate cancer, but the tried and true genetic test for prostate cancer is the Gleason system to look at cells under the microscope, grade them, and use their appearance to infer, particularly the genetics for propensity for rapid growth, propensity for metastasis, or even issues related to sensitivity to treatment, effectiveness of treatment. Cribiform is a refinement of that system. Unfortunately, I think we have to go through and enumerate the Gleason system a little bit to put cribiform in perspective. The Gleason system, which involves a compilation of two grades, the most common grade and the second most common grade seen in the same patient. So patients can have more than one type of prostate cancer in their biopsies or in their radical prostatectomy specimens. And the more common grade is listed first. So there's basically three grades. There used to be five grades. One and two were jettisoned because they were non-metastatic variants and uh, really aren't used anymore. But grades three, four, and five were kept. So grade three, the lowest. Grade four, higher grade and of greater concern. Grade five, the highest grade and of the greatest concern for aggressive cancer behavior. And the system involves what is seen most frequently in the biopsy or radical prostatectomy specimen, uh, the preeminence in the sequence. So you have, a, say, a Gleason 3, but there's less amount of 4 seen, so it would be a 3 plus 4 equals 7. The system sort of started at 6, which would be 3 plus 3, and ran up to 10, which is 5 plus 5. Studies of Gleason grading over the years have advanced greatly, and it really comes down to five categories. Gleason 3 plus 3, grouping 1. Gleason 3 plus 4, grouping 2. Gleason 4 plus 3. So you have two sevens, grouping 2 and 3. One beginning with 3, one beginning with 4. And then Gleason 4 plus 4, group 5 would be any 5. So 4 plus 5 or 5 plus 4. These five groupings have uh, showed nice predictive power for a spread, future metastasis, for longevity. The whole thing is a great system to try and profile and project who's going to run into trouble later based on their biopsy or their radical prostatectomy specimens. So where does cribiform come in? Cribiform is a refinement on the way that the pathologists look at grade four. So that's kind of the first jumping off spot of problems. If people just have three plus three, three everywhere, we counsel people that's never going to metastasize, it's harmless, doesn't need treatment, just keep an eye on it. But once you get three plus four, then the issue comes down to, well, how much four? Now we're dealing with something that does have a potential for serious behavior, but it's been learned that certain types of four and small amounts of four also behave in a pretty benign fashion. Therefore, someone that has mostly three and a little bit of four might be a candidate for active surveillance. Cribiform is one of four different types of four. Uh, the other, I don't even know the names of the other three types, but it turns out that the cribiform variant of four is the type of four that can cause problems. One way we look at, uh, as I already mentioned, this Gleason system is, well, how much four is present? The other way we look at the system is, is the four cribiform or not? If it's a cribiform type of four, then that has been associated with more aggressive behavior, just as men who would be facing higher amounts of four, let's say they had a four plus three, that means they even have more four than three, or if they have cribiform, these people have types of prostate cancer that universally are thought to be poor candidates for active surveillance. 
So as I've interviewed patients on this channel, I've encountered some of these patients who have had cribriform and they've even seen that the cancer has, you know, blocked their urinary passage and caused some issues. Is this a common thing for cribriform specifically? Well, it pretty much depends on how diligent people are in getting their PSAs every year, staying in a surveillance mode. Prostate cancer in my opinion, in this modern era with MRIs and PSA testing should never really present a problem. It should almost always be curable if it's diagnosed at an early stage, regardless of the grade. There are situations, of course, where people don't get their PSA checked or they don't get evaluated, they don't get MRIs, and the disease shows up at a more advanced stage. And yeah, all kinds of problems can come about as a result of not paying attention to the situation and allowing it to run longer and further than it should have ever been allowed. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that if you would like to support us financially, you can do so by visiting pcri.org forward slash donate. I also wanted to remind you that we have an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference this September, and you can learn more at pcri.org forward slash conference. And don't forget to click that subscribe button because it is a great way to support our channel and get our message out there. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schulz. So when we talk about these, you know, Gleason 7, 3 plus 4 versus 4 plus 3, you know, even with the 3 plus 4, if there is cribiform present with that 4, it would, it sounds like, lead somebody away from active surveillance and into treatment. So to what maybe percentage likelihood are they more at risk of metastases? Because that's really what we're looking at in these overall pictures when we're talking about um, these Gleason grades. They're really talking about what is your likelihood of metastasis, especially when people are doing early PSA screening. So with that cribriform present, what percentage likelihood of increased rate are we going to see that somebody, you know, really needs to make sure they don't do active surveillance and that they do go ahead and pursue treatment? When talking about decision making for active surveillance, we're always looking at a patient's age, what his goals are, are. But if you're taking a younger person in their 50s or 60s, there's very low tolerance for a risk of metastasis. In that scenario, any cribriform would probably uh, nix the active surveillance protocol, and you're thinking we should probably get rid of this. It becomes, therefore, in people that are being evaluated for possible active surveillance versus possible treatment, uh, very important to elicit whether or not cribriform is present. And this in men that are having biopsies can be related to sampling. Now they're showing that MRIs are pretty darn good at detecting areas in the prostate that have cribriform. If it's starting to show up as a pyrads 5, for example, cribriform is much more likely in that lesion that is being detected on MRI. And this circles back to a theme that we've emphasized repeatedly, that targeted biopsies, not random biopsies, can find these areas of cribriform with more precision. If you're just randomly sticking needles versus going after a, a, a known suspicious spot detected on an MRI with a targeted biopsy, you show that there is no cribriform, that it is 3 plus 3, or if it's a 3 plus 4, the type of 4 is not cribriform. Those people, in my opinion, are good candidates for active surveillance. So saying that there is cribriform present, like let's say we have a patient where they def definitively have cribriform, now, maybe they're a younger patient, and again, you, you have that zero tolerance for metastases. Would that change how they would be treated? Do they need to get um, maybe you know early hormone therapy? Do they need to do early chemo? You know What would that look like as far as systemic therapies to make sure we don't have the chance of microscopic metastases? Uh, one expert over in Europe that was looking at this said that people should look at it as if the Gleason score is accurate, that there is truly four present. If they are a 3 plus 4, say, with non cribriform maybe they should be downgraded at one grade groupings. So if they were a 4 plus 3 without cribriform maybe they should be thought of more like a 3 plus 4. If they were a, a 3 plus 4 without cribriform maybe they should be thought of more like a 3 plus 3. But the men that do have cribriform that they have bona fide 4 plus 3 and they should be treated appropriately the way a 4 plus 3 patient would normally be treated. That, of course, is evolving now that we have PSMA PET scans. Historically, all intermediate risk patients, so it would be any 7s, 3 plus 4s or 4 plus 3s, always got 3 to 6 months of hormone therapy, some form of radiation. The guidelines also suggest surgery is an option. I'm not a fan of surgery really pretty much for anyone anymore. But the idea in men who have clear PET scans do they still need hormone therapy? I think is a debatable issue, even though studies are still pending to really test that theory. The idea of cribriform then, I think, simply validates that it, as the grade starts going up, if you've got a four plus three and it's cribriform, 
treat it like a 4 plus 3. Don't presume that it's uh, going to have a low propensity for metastasis. Assume that it can metastasize. You ask what specifically would that risk be? I mean, as a general rule, we think of the risk of metastasis in a 4 plus 3 over a 10-year period, perhaps, to be in the maybe one out of five patients will develop metastasis within 10 years. An unacceptable rate. It's, we don't know which of the five patients would develop it, and therefore it's appropriate to treat all five to prevent that from happening. Are there any genetic tests or any other forms of screening and assays that patients can do to find out um, you know, if they haven't been yet diagnosed or anything coming down in this new technology that we see with this pipeline that would um, give patients a clue that this could possibly be a uh, you know, form for them? The common genetic tests that are used a lot in this realm, Artura, AI, Decipher, Prolaris, Oncotype, correlate with the presence or absence of cribriform type of prostate cancer. Do they add new, better information beyond what you already know when you see cribriform? I'm not sure that they do. Maybe they add a little bit more uh, depth in terms of risk. I've been hesitant to recommend these genetic tests because uh, while they will profile you and tell you if you have a worse or a better metastatic potential compared to other prostate cancer patients, the information that's provided with the test is based on outdated databases that are projecting much worse outcomes than what I see in the active surveillance patients that I'm treating commonly. Metastatic rates for 4 plus 3 of 10 to 15 percent, which seems outlandishly high. I think it's understandable because those databases were generated before we had PET scans, before we had MRIs, and the active surveillance techniques were nowhere near as what we have in 2025. So as I talk to patients uh, through our helpline and in the comments section, who not only have been told that they have cancer, but then when they get their pathology report back, they find out that cribiform is on that form, is on that report. It is quite intense and scary, and there's a lot of emotions behind it. What would you tell patients as a doctor who has treated all types of prostate cancer for over 30 years, and specifically patients who have had cribiform, you know, just for the mental and emotional load of seeing a word like that on a pathology report? I love the way that that physician in Europe put it, is that uh, if it is a 3 plus 4 with cribiform, it is a genuine 3 plus 4. It's hard for people coming into this uh, realm to understand this broad spectrum of what we call prostate cancer, the, the more serious types, the run-of-the-mill types, and the very harmless types. But I think it's fair to say that if you look at the worst prostate cancers, and that's maybe 10, 15 percent of people have like a Gleason 9, or maybe they have some early metastasis. These are, you know, Pretty, pretty serious from a prostate cancer perspective compared to the more harmless types and the less uh, malignant types that are actually much more common. These more serious types of prostate cancers, in most cases, in my opinion, are less serious than the best cancers when you look at other organ types. So it's much better to have a, quote, bad prostate cancer than a good lung cancer, than a good pancreas cancer, than a good bone cancer. And it's not really even close. Uh, a bad prostate cancer is way better than those other cancers, even in their early stages. And the reason that prostate cancer is so much better is the disease is more slow growing, it metastasizes more slowly, it's much easier to treat, it's much easier to monitor. Other cancers, the treatments are limited, it's difficult to monitor, and if they spread, it's almost always fatal. Patients with prostate cancer can live for 20 years with known metastasis, many times without much breaking a sweat. They may have to be on some sort of hormone treatment during that time. Patients do need to be reassured that prostate cancer is, uh, thankfully, especially the lower grade ones, not the high grade ones that I'm referring to right now, they're going to be a, a greater danger from the side effects of the treatment in most cases than they will be from the cancer. Patients that have the higher grade, high risk prostate cancers certainly have to take it seriously. Many times they'll have to go through multimodality therapy, but we expect the vast majority to go into a complete remission uh, with standard treatment. As Dr. Scholz was answering the question regarding the emotional impact and how to, you know, deal with that when you see a word like cribiform or cancer on your pathology report, one of the things that came to mind is just how many treatments there are in prostate cancer. You know, Dr. Scholz is comparing prostate cancer to various types of other cancers and talking about intensity levels. But in prostate cancer, there are a lot of treatments, and you're going to hear words like sequencing, and that's because they they have one treatment and they're going to go to the next and the next and the next. And so it's important when you talk to your doctor about your treatment options. One of the things that we've seen help kind of with the mental and emotional load of having maybe an advanced type of diagnosis is knowing what the game plan is ahead of time. I've heard Dr. Scholz and Dr. Moya talk about this so often. 
Okay, you're gonna put me on a first generation hormone therapy. If that fails, what's next? Okay, if the second generation fails, what's next? It's not that we're, you know, in any way saying it's going to or what timeline it's going to. It's more of if you have advanced prostate cancer, the reason we say prostate cancer is like a chronic disease is because there are a lot of treatments and you wanna make sure what the game plan is ahead of time if you do need another treatment. But this also helps you know that there are other treatments for your particular case and that you've talked to your doctor about the potential impact of those side effects and you've talked to your doctor about the potential impact of, okay, how long should I expect hormone therapy to work typically? If it doesn't work and the second generation comes in, what is that going to be like? Should I do second generation hormone therapy early? And you just look at these different types of treatment options ahead of time because you realize just how many there are. And I think that that's important to recognize as you go through this process and have that conversation with your oncologist. Now, another thing I want to point out is that we uh, interviewed a man named Ben Nathanson who had cribiform and he did an incredible interview. He also writes a blog about his experience and we're going to go ahead and link them in the comment section below this video because I think it's a great resource for you just to hear from a patient's perspective what his life was like dealing with it, but also how he's thriving now and the different options that he did with his doctor and the conversations that he had and the second and third opinions. I think all of that is just Ben beneficial information to you. Now, if you need help with your particular case, you can contact our helpline because these are advanced prostate cancer patients and they can answer a lot of your questions and they can help you get your questions ready for your doctor's appointments and also deal with some of the, the mental or the anxiety and things that you may be experiencing. But one of the things that I think is important is to bring somebody alongside of you. You are important. We say you're not alone here at PCRI because we want to remind you that not only are we here for you through our helpline and through these videos and our resources and our website and our conferences, but also there's a whole world of support out there. So we're going to list our support groups, virtual support groups, in-person support groups that you can visit and um, just talk to them about your experiences and what their experiences are and learn from them. And even the patients who comment in these videos know so much. And it's so awesome that you guys share your experiences in these videos and in the comment section because it's a great way for other patients to learn. And we love when we see this, you know, conversation between you guys. It's so precious. And I just really appreciate that you put yourself out there and you do it. And please remember, you know, maybe you find a friend or somebody to talk to, a partner, maybe an adult child who can help keep your records and get help. You know, I think the important thing is to remember that, you know, speak up. Speak up if you're in pain, emotional pain, mental health, anything like that. We want to make sure that as you go through this experience of dealing with prostate cancer, you're getting as much support as possible so we can get you the best outcomes. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching this channel, and I hope you have a great week.